And I wanted to say that presentations like this are contributions to public discourse at the university. As President Amy recently said, all members of the university community are encouraged to explore, discuss, and to listen to each other. Pizza and research uh, presentations have given us wonderful opportunities to hear about current research on socially significant issues, as well as, as an opportunity to ask perhaps difficult questions in a supportive environment. Um, I'm going to introduce Rachel Kennedy now. She is our education librarian, and she is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ostroff. I appreciate that. And hi, I'm Rachel Kennedy. I'm the education librarian, as you said. And I get the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Claudia Garcia Lewis. Uh, she is an assistant professor of educational leadership and policy studies here at the University of Texas in San Antonio. She draws from over six years of student affairs experience in order to bridge theory to practice and then back again. Her core values as an educator are to uphold social justice equity, and respect at all times, with an emphasis on the mastery of knowledge. She has facilitated numerous social justice workshops and consistently mediates difficult conversations in the classroom. Through her research, she seeks to disrupt the deficit thinking about communities of color, disadvantaged populations, and underrepresented students. Her goals are to expand the definitions of Latina dad and blackness in higher education, to make a critical contribution to a newly formed line of inquiry that explores the educational experiences of Afro-Latinxes and to conduct research that highlights the Latinx heterogeneity. And so without further ado, I give you our wonderful speaker today. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Um, it, it warms my heart to see so much interest and to see some new faces as well. Um, this really is a labor of love. Uh, and, and I'm glad to be here sharing it with you all. Um, Afro-Latinx is navigating blackness and Latinidad in the age of Trump. I would, re I would be remiss to not talk about what's going on in our society, social, politically. And so I think it lends itself great with this topic today. So thank you. Thanks for the invited talk. Um, it's always wonderful to be able to share this research. Um, and again, it is, a, it is labor of love. So before I get started, um, the great uh, James Baldwin uh, was in my mind and I saw this and I thought this this is so timely it's perfect because it embraces both my research interests but then also what's going on social politically so uh, he he says we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and the right to exist mm -hmm. and so in holding difficult conversations in my classroom some of my students are in in the audience today they know that I embrace difficult conversations <coughs> and it's extremely important to create a space where everyone is able to have an equitable voice but we always uphold respect in our class in my classroom and we always understand that by hearing the opposition or the opposite side we come to a common understanding and so really James Baldwin has inspired me and the type of research that I do and the presentation that I'm that I'm um, presenting to you all today so I wanted to share my researcher identity uh, because I think it's extremely important as a researcher I cannot disengage and leave my identity behind without under, without um, it informing my research and so my positionality is and I'm immigrant I was born in Mexico so everything that's going on today the caravan we were just talking about the human caravan that's 7,000 people strong coming to the United States of people who are seeking refuge that's real to me right those are things that as a researcher I cannot leave behind and it's deeply embedded within the types of frameworks that I bring to my research I'm also first gen. How many of you are first generation? Felicidades, congrats. I mean, that's, that's, you, you're here, right? And so you've been told you weren't supposed to be here, and here you are fighting the fight. And so I'm also a first gen and a mother. And so you'll talk about, I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, this whole social construction of race and ethnicity has always been very difficult for me. I have a pan-ethnic identity being born in Mexico. Uh, Hispanics don't exist over there, and yet in the United States I'm called Hispanic. And so that really informed how I wanted to approach research, the type of research I wanted to conduct, and the importance of complicating the social construction of race and ethnicity. 
because it has long-term consequences. I still don't know if I'm what I identify as. At one point, I was told I was white, and then eventually I learned that society doesn't see me as white, so of course I'm not white, right? But I still don't know what to check, so I usually just write in Mexican. This is me search, right? Research is me search. And so I was trained by researchers who said, you cannot make research personal. It has to be objective. You have to leave your identities behind. But again, my students will tell you that often, uh, I always remind them, you cannot, your worldview defines who you are and how you see things, what you're attracted to, the methods that you utilize. And so regardless of how difficult it is for all of us to acknowledge that it is not objective, even my quant friends, <laughs> I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> it, it, you can't disaggregate who you are, right? It's, it's a part of you. So this, is, this research is a labor of love, like I said before. It's also a passion of mine. I want to affect positive change. And so in my introduction, I think it's extremely important that we produce research that is real, that tells the stories of individuals, but that it has a positive effect in the long run, which is it's going to be provided through an asset-based perspective, which means that communities and, and individuals who are part of the research are going to be represented not as victims, but as individuals who also bring strength and, and, and personal cultural capital to our environment. Finally, I aspire to be a critical scholar. I, I think it's very difficult to say I'm fully there, but part of this critical scholarship is the types of methods I utilize, the language that I utilize, the type of scholarship I utilize. And so this really creates my positionality as a researcher. And I share that with you um, through radical honesty because I think it's extremely important to set the foundation and the stage for why I do the research that I do. So here are my research strands today. I will be talking about Afro-Latin Nexus within higher education. Uh, it is an ongoing project. It's national in scope, and you will see some of the quotes um, are from individuals at different institution types and different places around the country. Um, it is qualitative, and it is phenomenological. What that means, phenomenological, it took me a really long time to be able to say that in, in public and that fast, right? Um, <laughs> but what it means is that it's about stories. I sit with people and I ask them questions and they have a conversation with me. That's what phenomenology is. And it falls into two different buckets. I'm interested in the Afro-Latinx student experience as well as the Afro-Latinx professional experience within higher education. The second one is about being a Latina mommy scholar. I am a mother. I am proud of being a mother. Uh, again, I was trained in the way where they said, if you want to be a professional, you want to make a name for yourself, then you probably shouldn't have children. And so, and, and I'm sure many of us have been told that. Many of us are having that conversation, should I have children if I want to be a professional? And so I hold this as an emblem of identity and pride. And I, and I think it's extremely important to tell the stories of other Latina women who are also on the, on the tenure track, particularly the tenure track, because we have to publish, we have to serve, we have to talk, do these types of talks. So thank you for the invitation. It'll go on my CV. Uh, but it is, an, it is a national in scope, right? And, and it's a qualitative narrative approach. So I began a Latina Mami Scholar Collective. It's a collective of women nationally um, who are young Latina women and are part of the process. Again, me search all over this, right? And it's ongoing and growing. We continue to receive inquiries about people who are interested in being part of this. The final strand is we're doing all this great research, right? But what does that mean in terms of methodological um, implications? What does it mean in terms of pushing the boundaries methodologically? So I take all of my experience in doing this research and I want to affect the way research is being done um, in, in the future, in the field. And so a clear example is I'm not Afro-Latina, I'm Mestiza, and I'm conducting research on the experiences of Afro-Latinos. What that means is I have to build rapport, but you cannot build rapport with someone um, and you can't with one sitting, right? You, you have to have a sustained experience. But it's about the essence of the experience. So phenomenology says you have to be um, talking to them um, and it has to be one-to-one. -one. It can't be focus group. And so what I did is, and this is a manuscript that I'm working on, is I'm beginning to complicate the narrative around phenomenology. I'm saying that you have an interview to build that rapport, you have a focus group, and then you have that individual interview. And it's still phenomenology, but it's changing the approach. So that's, so that's complicating methodologies because it's suited for my population. So all of these are connected. So how are they connected, right? They're asset-based research. It incorporates social justice approach. What that means is that it humanizes individuals. It humanizes the participants. I don't say they're my participants, right? But rather, they're individuals who are sharing their story. So it's even 
It's even about the types of conversations that I have. It's extremely interdisciplinary. And that's difficult to understand, right? That within education, we expect to pull within education, but we don't get students in a vacuum. They come with their lived experiences, their professional experiences, the social pressures that are happening outside of campus are directly impacting how they feel on campus. And so it's extremely disciplinary. I pull from Latin American studies, ethnic studies, sociology, psychology, geography, um, to talk about how that impacts identity. And finally, it's critical scholarship. So now to get into what, what Afro-Latinidad is, I have this phenomenal video that really centers and, and introduces the topic. I remember when I first discovered what black was, and then people kept calling people black. I remember like, black, oh, he's black, oh, she's black. I'm like, black? They're not black, they're brown. They're dark brown, that don't make no sense. Being proud of my African roots is uh, something that I that I don't take lightly and I embrace because it's part of who I am. Nosotros queremos un mundo que decimos que tenemos un latino unidos, pero con el mismo tiempo la, tenemos que terminar la discriminación entre nosotros los latinos. Estamos como estamos porque somos racistas entre la, entre nosotros mismos, entre nuestra propia gente. Sabes que no nos apoyamos. I always feel like I'm never Latina enough because of my skin color, because of my hair. I would just hear my family be like, oh, don't go out with somebody that's dark skin. Que no salga con un negro. Arregla la raza. Dark skin in the Latino community isn't considered beautiful. We've been colonized so poorly that we want to identify with being white so much, not all of us, but many of us, that we look down on dark skin. Tú como negro latino tienes dos problemas. Primero eres negro, se te discriminan por negro. Y segundo eres latino y te discriminan por latino. Eso es doble minoría. I remember when I was a kid, I looked at myself in the mirror. Yo dije, esta nariz, estos labios que tengo yo, I'm ugly. ¿Sabes que yo era? Porque yo pensaba que yo era feo. Tuve una compañera de trabajo que me enteré que a mi espalda se expresaba de mí como mona, la mona. ¿Sabes qué es lo más triste? Era una Latina. I know I always stress to my family whenever they say something like, they'll be like, Julissa, tú y tú, tú y, y eso moreno. And I'm like, we are the morenos. <laughs> That's us. Your parents are instilling in you that these European features are the most beautiful thing. The standard of beauty for them is blonde hair and blue eyes. I think there's some colorism just across the board because we've been taught that lighter skin is Beautiful. Since light skin and fair skin is being portrayed on all, all platforms like TV and media and all of these things, it lets me know that that's what they perceive as beautiful. And then you look on TV and the telenovelas, they don't look like me, ever. The only one I can remember is Celia. Algo que me pasa muy seguido es que las personas dicen, ay, qué bonita eres para ser una negrita. Entonces, una persona negra no puede ser bonita. Dark skin is beautiful and it has melanin in it and it doesn't age. We hate ourselves so much that we really don't understand how beautiful we are. Que yo por mi color o por lo que tú crees, tú no me vas a parar, que yo voy a triunfar. En lo que yo voy a hacer, yo voy a triunfar. Embrace the beauty that is you because most people are trying to look like you. They're going to get their hair curled, they're going to get tans, they're getting injections in their butts and in their lips. They want to look like you. So don't hate you because everybody wants to look like you. Si había una fórmula, yo creo que ya lo habíamos arreglado. No hay ninguna fórmula. Tú como individuo tienes que enseñar a tu gente de ser orgulloso de ser lo que eres. Somos negros y debemos ser orgullosos de nuestra raza. And it's okay to be brown and dark, and it's okay to have beautiful, big lips and features like this. It is okay. It is more than okay, actually, because the world changes and moves in different rhythms. And right now, people want to look like us. <laughs> That's what I would say. So, there was so much in that video, right? And it's a sociology video, so it really talks about social experiences. In the field of education, then how does that relate to, to education? It relates to sense of belonging, like how, how are we expecting our students to come to campus and to be successful if we're not addressing colorism, if we're not addressing discrimination, if we're only focusing on certain aspects of discrimination, but we're not talking about colorism. So how many of you are familiar with colorism? Okay, so some of us, for some of us that are not, it's colorism is intragroup discrimination based on skin tone. 
So, the light, so within the group, the lighter skin you are, the preferential treatment you will receive. If you're darker, then you will be discriminated against or you will be called a mona, right? And so we saw that in the example. Uh, the older man also said, there is no magic formula. So what is the formula? It's having conversations around what it means to be racialized. So a lot of them are being racialized. What that means is that based on your appearance, you will have an ethnic label placed upon you because of what you look like. And what that means for our students in particular, because I'm in higher education, it means that best practices that are being developed to support Latinx students are being developed to support Latinx students like myself. But that does not account for racial intergroup discrimination. And so regardless of how many best practices we develop, we will not be able to embrace and encompass light-skinned Latinos or dark-skinned Latinos. It will be, they're usually centered around mestizaje. So there's a lot more implications there, but when we think about our students and why our students aren't being successful, we have to think about history, right? So that's the interdisciplinary aspect. We have to pull in history, and this is a direct example of history. How many of you have seen this map before? Okay, so some of you have. For some of you, this might be new, but this is a, this is a transatlantic slave trade. So when people were enslaved in Africa and taken to, to the Americas, uh, in the United States, we think that the world revolves around, the, around us, and more often than not, our education is usually U.S. education and nothing outside of U.S. education. So when we think about the transatlantic slave trade and we think about who was enslaved and brought over, we think that they all were brought to the United States, or the majority. And you'll see it's only 5%. The rest were taken to Central and South America and the Caribbean. For those Mexicano friends of mine, yes, we also have African influence within Mexico, but we, we decide to reject that aspect, right? And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, but definitely within the Caribbean, the majority were brought to the Caribbean and Brazil. Brazil has a large influence of African uh, lineage. So this is not a new type of people. This is historically rooted within our history, within our land, within uh, colonization, directly embedded within. So Afro-Latinxes are not new. This is for Mexico. Some of you may be familiar with this. I see some, some head shakes, right? This is how, so how do you sustain a system of privilege and oppression? Well, you have to get buy-in into the system. So colorism exists only because people have bought into whiteness being better than darkness, right? And so when colorism takes effect um, and you're enacting upon it, what you're doing is you're attempting to sustain a system that is very antiquated and it goes back to colonization. So within this, um, this is the, the Spaniards were meticulous record holders and so this is the system that was established in Mexico. They identified the peninsulares, which were the Europeans, and you'll see at the very top. Um, and then you'll see the, the very bottom are, are black mixture. So African um, people who were enslaved and brought over. Um, and then anything in between is a mixture between Spaniards and, and, and they call them indios or indigenous peoples, all the way down to when you begin mixing with blacks. Spaniards were always at the top. What that meant was that they recognized 16 official mixtures, but within there, there was a great variety. So this right here is the system that continues to prevail to this day. It was so beautifully crafted, and I say beautifully because it was an art to get people to buy into, if I'm darker skinned, I'm not as worthy, and so I will allow the oppression to take take effect. And that's essentially what ended up happening. At the very top, you can't read it, but it's, it's Spanish with Indian mixture, and that's a mestizo. And that comes into effect in terms of what I'm about to go into next. So it is a legacy of colonization. And mestizaje really was seen as the emblem of bringing together Latin American countries um, after a lot of, so 1910, 1912, that was when a lot of Latin American countries were, were um, becoming independent. And so they needed something to bring them together, right? And so they, they, a lot of Latin American philosophers upheld this mestizaje as la raza cósmica, Jose Vasconcelos, some of you may be familiar with Jose Vasconcelos, who, who really glorified this identity of mestizaje. But, what they don't tell us is that mestizaje was a Darwinian term. And what that means is that you were moving away from indigenismo, because you glorified some aspects of indigenismo, but only the good aspects, right? Like the Vasta calendar. And even nowadays, we continue to do that, right? Like there's certain aspects of indigenismo that we like, uh, but the other aspects we reject. Uh, completely erase the African lineage that existed within the within mestizaje and aspired whiteness. And so essentially that's what mestizaje is uh, and, and it's, it's connected 
deeply into our colonial history. Sorry, self-quoting. No, I, sh I shouldn't say sorry. I'm self-quoting because I'm the only one doing this research and education, so yay. Um, <laughs> Afro-Latinxes are neither biracial nor multiracial. And I've heard this so much, particularly in education conferences. They say, well, why don't you look at the, at the biracial or multiracial student literature? That should help you look at it. And I said, no. Afro-Latinxes, not all Afro-Latinxes are a mixture, a recent mixture. You saw the history, right? So it's deeply embedded throughout our DNA. And so it, it amounts for a different experience. So they're, um, they're nor biracial, but rather a rich amalgamation of historical mixture between European conquistadores, various indigenous groups, and blacks. Very different, and it's deeply rooted within our history. What do we know about Afro-Latin nexus within education? So this is a new field of inquiry within education in particular. Like I said before, I'll, I draw a lot of my things from sociology. Sociology has a long history of conducting research in this area but we have not really assessed what it means to be Afro-Latinx on a college campus. And so what we do know is that a colleague of mine are doing this research, um, and, and what we do know is that Afro-Latinx has encountered this difficulty in finding community on campus. And for those of us who are educators, we understand that the number one way to keep students on campus is by helping them find community, right? If, you, if students are able to anchor their identity and find community on campus, they are more likely to persist. If they don't, who wants to be in a place where you feel like you're sticking out like a sore thumb or you don't have a place where you belong? And so that's the danger in it. But what ends up happening is that they're not black enough or they're not Latino enough, and oftentimes it has a lot to do with their phenotype. What do you look like? Are, are, you, are you dark enough where you can pass? And, or are you just a complete different mixture and, 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 we, and you can't find uh, space? And I'll talk, the, the examples will provide a little bit of, of um, background on this. Language is spoken. So contrary to popular belief, Latinos don't just speak Spanish. In a study that I conducted, I'm not gonna talk about today, in a study that I conducted on the experiences of, of Afro-Latinx students, I had 12 participants and they spoke seven different languages, okay? So it's not just Spanish. There was Garifuna, there was uh, uh, a dialect within uh, Providencia Santa Catalina in Colombia. So there's a rich variety of language. And when you bring Spanish into the mix, it's not just Mexican Spanish, right? We have Dominican Spanish and Hondureño Spanish. And even within Mexico, you have different uh, things for different. So don't be fooled, right? Like there's, 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 and language matters because language provides meaning and context to experiences. And finally, this perceived foreigner status, right? We don't know where to put you in, so you're always a foreigner. Whether you, you're too dark to be a Latino, you're too, you're too uh, but you're dark and you speak Spanish, so I really don't know where to put you in. So we have this cognitive dissonance around what we perceive to be a Latinx individual and where their, their fit is, is supposed to be. They also encounter, so because of that, they encounter this difficulty in gaining group membership because of this double minority status that the man had talked about, right? Um, he, he mentioned, we, we, we're, we're basically double minority, we're black and we're Latino, and so we get it double in terms of um, rejection. So overall, there's no, there's no research that talks about Afro-Latinx professionals' experiences in navigating higher education. So they're called to support students, right? But what happens when they themselves are attempting to gain that group membership, when they're attempting to find a sense of identity and connection to the institution? So that's what I'm gonna share with you today is that strand of research. Um, so factors that we do know based on all of the other fields that impact Afro-Latinx individuals is this panethnic identity. So if you, so the difference between African Americans and uh, Afro-Latinx individuals is that African Americans cannot easily connect their history to Africa, to a country in Africa, because it was taken away from them when they were enslaved and brought over. Whereas Afro-Latinx, they're able to say, well, I'm fifth generation born in the US, but I know that my family's history comes from Honduras or Guatemala or wherever it may be, which directly impacts the types of food you, you, you eat, what you, you know, how you dress, your, your celebrations. It impacts the formation of your cultural identity, right? And so Latinxes have this panethnic identity that they can go back and forth to, that there's this language that is attached to a land um, that African Americans don't have. 
they have to constantly transverse this cultural, ethnic, and racial barriers, right? So with having two different bodies of land that they can, uh, that they can call home, the U.S. and a nation of origin, family's nation of origin, they also have to balance two cultures, two races, two ethnicities, because the social construction of race and ethnicity is bound within each geographic boundary. So what that means is me as a Mexican who immigrated to the U.S. when I was four years old, when I go to Mexico, I'm not Mexicana, but here I'm not American. Right? And so Gloria Saldua talks about living in the borderlands, right? Like, I'm not Mexican enough. You know, Selena, that, that video where, like, you're not Mexican enough and you're not American enough and it's exhausting? Absolutely, right? So imagine always having to be back and forth on this. Region within the U.S. matters, right? So my research has been conducted, uh, the majority of it has been conducted in the, north e in the, in the eastern side of the United States. Um, and that's because we know that the prevalence of Afro-Latinx individuals uh, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans tend to reside in, in, in the New York area, particularly the Bronx. Uh, but we have Af uh, we have um, um, Blacksicans in California, right? Because there's this prevalence of Mexicanos in that area. So it's very different. So region matters. And even in, in where we're at today in Texas, this used to be Mexico, right? And so we need to own the fact that history matters and that that also has a deep and profound impact on identity. Language, I talked a little bit about language. And then this whole view around race and ethnicity has really thrust Afro-Latinxes into invisibility. They don't fit neatly within the social construction of race and ethnicity and the federal guideline standards that we have established and that as institutions we have to fill out. I was talking to uh, a student earlier uh, before the presentation and, and she was saying, I don't know what to check. When, what, I, I, I don't know what to check. I check African American, but I'm not African American, and they tell me to, and then I check Hispanic, and absolutely, right, we are not quantifiable, but yet we are asked to quantify our identities. And this whole essentialistic form of Latinidad and blackness has really pushed them to choose between the two. Either you're with us, or you're with them, but there's no way you can claim both because for some reason, we feel that we have to only have ownership of one or the other. Which brings me to my study on Afro-Latinx's uh, professionals in higher education. This is a national study, it's, it's, it's ongoing. Um, it's a qualitative study, it's phenomenological in nature, which means that I have individual conversations with these people. Um, and I was really interested in, again, finding out what their experiences are as they're attempting to make sense of their identity within the social construction of race and ethnicity on college campuses, but are being asked to support students who are being attacked by our current president, right? So that, that, what, that was a topic around um, what does it mean to be an Afro-Latinx student affairs professional or a faculty member on a college campus in the age of Trump. And so this is what Marie is an adjunct professor. She identifies as Puerto Rican, and she's at a private, selective, comprehensive university in California. And this is what she said. I'm not a, I'm not a representation of the African American community. It's really difficult for me to say that I'm going to be the bridge between the black community and the Latino community. I can't. I'm really only one extra link in that connection that brings those two communities a bit closer. So what she talks about is that she's that one. Right? She's the one black person and Latina person, and she's very, she speaks Spanish a lot. And so, what she's asked to do is to be the representative for the African American community. What she's saying is that I'm not, I can't be. So, when they have an event, what, what do you think African Americans would want? Because it's a very selective institution and it's a PWI. And so, she's often having to, again, negotiate her identity. People racialize her because she's dark skinned. They say, oh, well, you must know because you're black, so you must know what all black people want. This, is, this, this quote that um, I'm about to read talks about how she has to navigate being a faculty member in the classroom. And she teaches undergraduate students. Uh, the major uh, She said about 150 in her classroom. And so remember the institution type matters, right? Um, a lot of these students um, come from affluent backgrounds and they're also majority white students. And so this is what she says. I tell them, this is my work hair. I play with my hair. It's flat ironed, I say. This is my work here. One, it's easier. I don't have to do a whole lot, and I love to sleep, so I try to minimize work and maximize the amount of, amount of sleep I can get in the morning. I have to literally iron out as many differences as I can to pass through your defenses, because the minute I walk into your space, there's a, subse 
there's a subconscious responses to me that are defensive. I need to do that. I need to do what I can to slip past that. So she's talking about the classroom being their space, right? And she works there. So she already knows that she's this perceived foreigner status, right? You're not, she's, she's not immune to it even, even though she's a faculty member. She's still very much a part of trying to make sense of her identity and find space on campus. The other aspect that she was talking about is she's trying to literally iron out differences, right? How profound is that to say that something as small as hair, and I say small, right, like it, it, it's, it, it shouldn't matter, but it does for her. So she's trying to make sense of her identity so that students don't give her poor evaluations because she's an adjunct faculty member, which means it's not secure for her. So she is navigating her own sense of identity and trying to make sense of who she is while trying to also be professional. And, and quite honestly, she's a, phenomen she's a phenomenal educator, and so she talks about helping them come to terms with who they are and, and their experiences as well. So it's this voluntary invisibility. So she, yes, she wants people to know she's Afro-Latina, but at the same time, she's also just trying to survive and make it and go, go in, 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 essentially be invisible. The, the other theme that I've been seeing resonate is supporting while needing support. And so Isabella is a staff um, in student services. She identifies as Panamanian, and she's at a public, predominantly white institution, a tier one institution in the southwestern United States, and this is what she said. So it's definitely not easy because I possess all of these identities and the fear that although I am a legal permanent resident, there's still a fear that that might be taken away or that I'm not protected or I'm not wanted here in, in this country. As much as I've tried to be successful and learn and grow here, it's still not a place that I'm welcome. So she's talking about the age of Trump, right? Because I said, what does it mean for you to be working on a college campus in the age of Trump? And she talks about that. She talks about how it's extremely difficult for her to make sense of what's going on. Uh, she's a legal permanent resident. So even that is not secure anymore, right? So even living in fear, she's not undocumented, but she's still living in fear of what that means for her. And it becomes even more complicated when she's asked to support students. So this is what she says. I definitely think about all of my identities and ways that I can identify with students that are also going through the oppression of Trump's decisions. And so it's difficult, but at the same time, it's important to find others that identify with at least one of the roles that he's kind of trying to exclude. Is this something that we want to tolerate? But finding, finding those type of communities is definitely needed to bring light to Afro-Latinidad and our experiences and how it's not easy to try to figure out that identity or to try to settle and be comfortable in that identity. So this is her navigating her spaces, right? Making sense of, I'm having to make myself feel comfortable and safe on my college campus, but even though I don't know how to make myself feel comfortable, I have to find those students who are navigating these experiences and help them find a sense of support and comfort on, on a college campus. Um, we are them. So Amaiz is a mid-level administrator. She identifies as Garifuna Hondureña, and she works at a community college in the Pacific Northwest. I know afro Latin Nexus. We're in solidarity with our Latin Nexus. We're in solidarity with the struggle that our Afro, that our Latinx community is going through. We're in solidarity with the struggles that our African American, black community is going through. And what I want people to know is that we are in all of those areas. We have Afro-Latin Nexus that are being deported. We have Afro-Latin Nexus that are being arrested for being black, that are being beaten up, that are being detained. And so, and she mentions this because through this, she works at a community college and she supports a lot of these students who have gone through this. So she went on to talk about, I asked her, can you, can you tell me a little bit more? And she was telling me that um, when we talk about DACA students, we, we often racialize who DACA students are, and by default, they're, they're Latino. And what she's saying is that we forget about other students who are also going through the process. And she, she mentioned a student who was deported, who was Afro-Latinx, and whose family was looking for them. They didn't know where they were, but she, they knew that she had a connection with them. So they came to her office, and she had to tell them that that student had been deported. Um, uh, she talks about um, being targeted. Her brother, who is Afro-Latinx as well, was targeted by the police um, and, and had to, and, 
and, and was detained for, for, for a number of hours. And so she talked about how much fear that instilled in her, but how much, um, and, and so this is the resiliency part. I'm gonna highlight this next quote because it's not just, they're not passive, right? There's, there's resiliency there, and I wanna highlight the resiliency. She says, I think we're in an era where students are traumatized. They're hypersensitive. All my students of color, my students of color are, all of my students are hypersensitive to do, to what is being said in the news and it's crisis mode. Everything from what's happening to our students with DACA to the increase in police brutality and the Black Lives Matter movement and it's just, if I could, working in the era of Trump as an Afro-Latina is exhausting because all of this affects me personally, right? I don't walk out the office and leave these identities at the desk. I walk out of the office knowing, okay, I can be pulled over today for simply being black and having to worry about family being discriminated against for them not knowing a language, English, not being able to defend themselves, not having status, citizenship status, even residents, even being a resident is at risk now. Being a resident of the United States, not having the proper documentation, that's scary to me, it's difficult, but it's even more of a reason to be vocal. So she's extremely involved on her college campus in creating coalitions and supporting students. And so it, go, it comes at a cost, right? She talked about long hours at, at work. She's talked about, and we know this happens all the time, where women of color, particularly women of color, are asked to serve in diversity task forces, right? And, and how, um, but she's doing her part. So she knows and she lives in this fear, but at the same time, if she is idle, then nothing is going to get resolved. So these are prevalent, these are initial findings, right? And uh, the study is ongoing, but regardless of where they're at, I showed you the West Coast, the East Coast, and, and Central United States, the stories are the same. There's fear. There's fear around the rhetoric. There's fear around self-identifying as, as one or the other, but it's also um, this, this idea of having to, to out your identities and saying, I'm both of these and I embrace these. Um, and so Afro-Latinos are, Afro-Latinx professionals are navigating, negotiating their own identity while attempting to support their students. And so as institutions, we need to understand what that means for our, our professional staff. They don't leave their identities at the desk. And when she said that, I, it, it hit home, right? It hit home for many reasons. And it's difficult to, to go home and say, well, what happened on campus? I'm just gonna leave it there and I'll pick it back up. This student crisis, I'm just gonna pick it up when I come back in the, into the office. We know that that doesn't happen. We know that they take these experiences with them to the house, that they're constantly trying to figure out how to support their students. <clears throat> the age of Trump means their multiple marginalized identities are hyper-visible, which leads to a constant state of needing to protect themselves, but then also trying to take care of their students. And that's exhausting. So implications for, for educational institutions, there's this ethical and professional obligation to disaggregate Latinx ethnic group identity or, uh, by race. And in, within higher education, we need to be doing that so that we can best support our students. We need to know who's on our college campuses. We need to be able to provide them the opportunity to self-identify as both black and Latino, but we are coined, we're, we're called to only follow federal guidelines, which doesn't allow for us to be able to do that. And why is that important? Because once we know who's on our college campus, then we can better tailor best practices, services, and programs that are tailored for, their, for, for our students. We also need to consider the burden that Afro-Latinx professionals take with them when they are seeking belonging while also supporting our students, right? And that's extremely important. We talk about retaining our students, but we seldom talk about retaining our, our, our staff, faculty members who are also part of this population. And then finally, consider region and institution type when developing these services and programs. All of that matters, right? Community colleges are very different than four-year institutions and private institutions, but region also matters. And so there's, um, there's, a, there's a deep need for us to be able to move beyond that, to acknowledge that we need to account for these differences. So my contact information. Um, thank you so much for, for attentively paying attention. <laughs> Time for questions, of course. Please ask. And not all at once, please. <laughs> yes. So 
So have you um, considered studying the impacts of not only professionals in the academic environment, but professionals in all of the environments of society that are expanding your research to include yeah, that's a good question. So um, my field is within higher education. So if I want tenure, I have to stay within <laughs> higher education, uh, which I do want tenure. Uh, uh, but so my, my, I was just at a, re, at a geography research conference. And what I found out um, was that geography is not just about physical space. It's, it's not just about land, right? It's about space, like claiming space in a room, in an in a, in, in identity. And so it was the race, education, and place conference. And what they talked about was this, exactly that. How do you talk about individuals and experiences without accounting for what's going on in society? How do you talk about student experiences if you don't take into these as aspects into account? So my research centers in higher education. I particularly want to make a, uh, an impact within higher education, but I cannot talk about the education educational experiences of students without talking about what's going on in society. And so that's why talking about Trump is particularly important because what's going on social politically is not only impacting our students and how and what happens on campuses, it's, it's impacting non-Afro Latinos, right? It's impacting how we treat each other and the types of conversations that we have. Um, so not necessarily outside of higher ed, but it's certainly interconnected. It certainly is looking at, at complicating race and ethnicity and how, it, how it's perceived and felt and lived, right? And so that's the difference between qualitative and quantitative research is that qualitative gives you that opportunity to have those conversations around. And for I have some students who are here in the audience who are, who are part of my research team, and they've read the transcripts. And so while I ask them questions about their college experience, they will talk about their family and their community and their job and whatnot because it directly informs their experience on campus. And so I, I, I account for that in my research, but um, I want to better understand how to support our students on a college campus to then be able to provide, just like my introduction said, right, to be able to inform practice and then let's make it better. Let's tailor it for our student population instead of trying to get a best practices book off the shelf and then say, okay, you, UTSA, this is going to work for you even though it was developed at a PWI in Michigan. It makes no sense. Yes. Have you thought about maybe staying with an education but up all levels of education? Mm -hmm. Like, as a parent, I've had, you know, being here in San Antonio, your kids go to school here, the Alamo is a big deal. So when they um, learn about the Alamo, my son came home and he was very upset. He said, Mexicans are the bad guys. And that was really yeah. yeah. So this research is me search. And I have children who are Afro-Latinos. And so I, I hear you. And so I have a daughter who's five years old. And I've been working with her on her being proud of her identity as an Afro-Latina since the day she was born. So. I, I, I constantly compliment on the power that she has, and I've, the books that I read are always centered around that. So while we can only do so much within our, our institutions, I think that we have to empower ourselves as parents, right, to be able to have these conversations and have them um, in, in a way that our children are resilient. So yeah, it hurts, right? And we can't change the whole system, but I think it's extremely important to have those conversations with our children. My sister, who was, um, at the time she was a kindergartner, and I was a, uh, I, so we have a huge age gap. She went, I grew up in Oregon, and so she was in kindergarten, and I had taught her about Thanksgiving, right? The real history of Thanksgiving. And her teacher was saying, the pilgrims were wonderful, and this and that, and then she goes, uh-uh, they killed the indigenous peoples. <laughs> and so, so what was the teacher's reaction? What was the teacher's reaction? Kimmy, you're wrong. That's not true. So what did my sister do? She said, I need to call my mom. And she was just crying and crying and crying. And so what ended up happening was that the teacher had a real conversation with the mom. So it's unfair, right? It's unfair that we have to challenge the history, the erroneous history, the censored history that is being told. But it takes a community to be able to do that. And so um, I fight my own battle with my family right, um, in terms of what it means to be an Afro-Latina. And my daughter, I always talk about my daughter, she's extremely articulate, extremely smart. 
I see some head shakes because the people who know her know that. And so she, her name's Victoria, and she corrects people, and she says, my name's Victoria, it's not Victoria, right? And so she's five, but not all of us are empowered to do that, right? So we think about our parents who don't have the opportunity to come to an educational institution and to have these conversations. When we think about my parents who were farm workers and who didn't have the opportunity to go to school, how do, you, how do we get that conversation to them? Well, in ELPS, we have a social justice initiative, right? Like we, as educators in the ELPS program, who are preparing college, uh, who are preparing college professionals, but then also at the K-12 level, principals and superintendents, they're being challenged on what it means to call a little black girl um, uh, saying she's sassy versus intelligent, and that matters, right? So. They're being taught Paulo Ferrer's work. They're being taught about the social construction of race and ethnicity. And so these are our educational leaders um, who are going through this program, but it takes a community. I don't know what the right answer is other than as a parent, I'm, I'm as concerned as you are. Absolutely. But then also those of us who, you know, I'm gonna call out those of us who have privilege in the field and in the room. If you have privilege, then you need to use your privilege to advocate for your brothers and sisters, right? We're all in this together. So if you are white, you have to have these conversations with your white colleagues. I will never be able to be in a white circle. In a, well, in a white and close circle and be fully accepted, right? And so you have that, op you have not only that responsibility, but it's an ethical imperative that should be in your DNA to call each other out. And so these are the conversations that we should be having that are extremely difficult, right? Like, I, w I didn't choose to be born white. No, you didn't. But with your identity comes responsibility. And so that's what we have to do. And these are hard. Like, how do you do that? Who's this Claudia telling me that I have to do that, right? Like, it's true. How do we do that? But even within our communities, like people of color, we have to then call each other out on our sexism and our xenophobia and our discrimination and our colorism. We have to do that. We don't call our indigenous brothers and sisters indios. We call them indígenas, right? Language matters and it has weight. Yeah. Yes. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you. This is extremely informative and um, I, this is great work that you're doing. So um, I, I'm like a 30 year comrade vet. I've been there, daddy got a t shirt, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm in a social work program with that. So I just, I, I, uh, I have more of a comment, a couple comments, but I was going to say for her, like, yeah, it's like history is super important, like you said, because if you had known, like, if we look at the map of America, quote unquote America, I mean, what we're talking about, Texas <laughs> and Oklahoma, all that used to be belong to Native Americans. So when you're saying, like, okay, Mexicans were the bad guys, no, that, it's all about perspective. And so, you know, I'm blessed and fortunate that I'm like second generation. My parents were college educated and all that whole stuff. And um, so that changed my trajectory and how I look at things. And education is very important because like, if you're the only black kid in an all white classroom, mm -hmm. like for my son, when um, he came back from Germany and we were in Virginia, and uh, one of his uh, history class professors or instructors were saying, well, you know, the Black Panthers were the equivalent of the Klan. And my son was like, <laughs> and he raised his hand, so he said, you mean that black people, the Panthers were out lynching people. They were out here doing all these different, because he knew his history. You know, and I was so oh, super proud of it. Yeah. But he knew his history, so it's like, this is absurd what you're saying. No, this was a response, a, symptom, a response to a symptom that had been going in the black communities and that was horrific. So, history is very, very important. So, be proud to be Mexican and know your history. It's a beautiful history. And I, you know, um, but I was just gonna say, our stories are very, African-American stories and Hispanic stories are so similar. So I wanna get emotional. They're just so very brief. And you know, the whole backstory of like, where people coming from being kidnapped and brought to different parts of America, okay? And then the whole colonialism and then the colorism that's in the black community even to this day, but it's like for almost 400 years you were fed a, a dose of low self-esteem. It's like the darker you are, the, the worse you are. And the closer to white are your oppressors, the better you are. And that's the same thing I see. You know, I have a lot of friends who are Hispanic and they say it's the same thing. We don't talk about it out loud and it's getting better, but I mean, you know, what is it? what's the statistic? Like how many positives do you, do you have to have to erase the negative, you know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's a long way coming, but um, 
And I just want to say, when you're uh, about community on campus, that's another argument for you keep historically black colleges and universities because when you're going and when you're so small, such small numbers, if you don't have a good foundation, college is hard, period. <laughs> But if you're like the lone wolf or only a couple of you, and then not everybody's um, monolithic, you know? Just because we're both black doesn't mean we have anything in common. I'm from the East Coast, he's from the South. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? I might have more in common with a soldier, a white guy, you know, because when we speak, we're, the culture is the same. So that's another argument, like, to keep historically black colleges and universities because they're very, very important because people feel a sense of kinship. And you know, when something is hard, you can reach out to somebody that doesn't make you feel stupid or bad, and so on and so forth. So, last thing, and I'm sorry, because I just like so proud of you. <laughs> I'm just so inspired. I'm very inspired. Um, I think back in the '60s, you think the '60s of the Civil Rights era, where you, you know, for Black people, it's always been the, you're in the Martin camp or you're in the Malcolm X camp, you know. But at the at near the end of their lives, they were looking holistically and saying, okay. Dr. King is like, we have to get people of color and poor people together because we have more in common, you know? And so then we can fight for each other, or advocate for each other. And you know, even Malcolm X, you know, and I'm, I'm a Malcolm X fan, so I, he was just saying, hey look, you know, you don't take a beat down because you're Muslim or Christian or atheist or whatever. People look at you and see a black person and you know, especially with the police, you know, and you suffer. <laughs> Not because, because like you're saying about, you know, Hispanics or Latinos that are dark skin or brown skin, they're not saying, okay, are you Hispanic? No, it's like you're, you look black, so there's a beat down coming. So um, that is a reality in my world, you know? So, um, you know, I've had all kinds of weird things happen. You know, I'm a retired senior officer. When I'm on post in uniform, my life is golden. The second I step off base and I look like Jamie, <laughs> then I'm like any other black person, which is not good. So I just want to say thank you. I'm thank sorry. you. And thank you for your service. Um, you. My husband's retired 20 years, so I, I know the military life, right? I think it's, it's so thank you for your service. I, you brought up a great point in terms of diversity. So what is diversity, right? And who does it benefit? And so when we talk about diversity, we need to acknowledge that recognizing diversity usually benefits white students. And it's difficult to hear, right? But why is it that it's white students who benefit? Because they learn so much from students of color, from people who are minoritized in terms of how they navigate institutions. We have been navigating institutions for so long. I remember translating for my grandpa who was about to get open heart surgery as an elementary schooler, right? In elementary school. How dare the doctor even allow me to do that, right? So those are, those are systemic and endemic problems that continue. But what that provided me with is resiliency. And so oftentimes we're told that our stories don't matter, that we're another brown face or another black face in, in the classroom. And in reality, what it takes is faculty members, teachers, right, who are there putting up the fight and saying, you know what, your, 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 your stories are valuable. And what we don't recognize is that the white students who are in our classrooms often kind, not all the time, right? But oftentimes come from such homogeneous communities that have never heard these stories of resiliency. So when we are in the classroom, everyone's story should matter. But unfortunately, we've gone through an educational system that has taught us that our history doesn't matter, that indigenas are not, that, 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 that our people are not, don't come from science and math, even though the Aztec calendar and the, the Mayan calendar are the most precise in the world to this day right we don't acknowledge these so we teach our children this and not just our biological children right our people who we associate ourselves with then what will end up happening is that it, this richness begins to emerge and respect should should thrive right um, but it's difficult it's a difficult process yeah do you have a question no, I was just going to congratulate Dr. Garcia, Lewis Corper, and, you know, for her work in doing it. And my work, we're colleagues in the same department. My work focuses on faith of leadership, and I think that, you know, what she speaks of is something that us as researchers and also as practitioners that put in the K-12 system need to highlight and bring into our practice if we really want to address some of the issues that you presented, because it starts at the formation of our K-12 school systems and how we kind of <coughs> do blankets practices, you know, this best practices approach using from homogeneous groups where we know our communities uh, are becoming more diverse.
others with all the different intersectionalities, right? So I do want to thank you. And thanks, everyone, for, for your support. I have business cards over here if you're interested in um, coming onto the program or whatnot. Well, and I just well, thank you so much oh, thank for you. everything thank that you've you taught us. Um, you taught me a lot of things. I really appreciate your thank time you. and, and sharing your talents and sharing your knowledge thank and your you. wisdom with us. Thank you. Um, I do highly encourage you, please, please fill these out. This is going to help us with further programming. Um, we're just so grateful you all are here. And a huge thank you again thank you. to thank Dr. You. Claudia Garcia. Thank, thank you. you.